Okay, great. Yes, we will be recording. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody to this information session for the 2023 applications. Um, just very briefly, my name is Clinton Hines and I'm the convener of the Landscape Architecture Program here at UCT. And uh, Christine Price, you see in the room as well, is the other full-time permanent staff member and then we have a number of part-timers which are not joining us now but who also teach in the program. So we have uh, lots of various uh, inquiries about the program that come through to us so we formulated this idea for information sessions a while ago and they work very very well. So yeah welcome to the information session we hopefully won't take too long we want to give you uh, as much background as we can into studying landscape architecture, what's it about, and then the application information as well. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, uh, what we're going to cover today is, well, first of all, a, bit, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please post your name and where you are from and what you're studying in the chat. Uh, it's always nice for us just to, we're not going to hound you with any, any emails or anything like that. It's just good to know uh, generally where people are coming from. So it helps us to understand uh, how effective our marketing is. We will be recording the session. And so if you don't want your voice recorded or whatever on the session, if you ask a question, please just post your question in the chat. Um, keep your mics muted as well. And then please do type any questions that you have. Just type them in the chat as well. Um, and um, we will get to those questions at the end. If we can't cover all the questions in the, um, the session, just leave us your email address there and we can answer that question as well. Um, Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go through uh, studying landscape architecture at UCT. Uh, what are the requirements? And because it's a postgraduate only, what undergraduate degree is eligible for you to enter and apply for landscape architecture? Uh, so we'll go through that first, and then we will have a, a session with three recent graduates that we've asked: Kazeka, Hayden, and Apalele who have very kindly agreed to share very briefly the experience of studying landscape architecture and where they find themselves at the moment and what they're doing. And then we'll just go through some of the application and selection process, and then we've, we'll take some questions at the end. Um, we will more than likely later in the year, closer toward the end of the year, once we've got hopefully some of your applications in, we'll have another session just to chat in more detail about following your application through the process. So we'll probably have a follow-up session later. Firstly, we just wanted, and uh, anybody just raise a hand if you have an urgent question that you do need to ask me, which you might not be in a chat, but uh, Christine will keep an eye on that. But better to just post your question in the chat and we'll come to them at the end. Um, this is just a few slides about what it's like studying landscape architecture at UCT. So, because especially if you're coming not from a design undergrad, if you're coming from a different kind of undergrad, then the world year is a little bit different. A design, a design course like landscape architecture has uh, sessions where you work long practical sessions where you design, you're drawing and you're designing. So the visual spatial production of of drawings that's the world that you that you occupy when you're here and this is examples of students presenting in examination format most of these are from examinations and that's what it looks like you've designed a landscape you've conceptualized the landscape you've thought about how best to respond to a design challenge in the landscape and these are examples of students presenting their work for us this is um uh, the 2021 last year's Coral Brick Awards. We have a great relationship with Coral Brick who sponsor uh, awards. These are not only the landscape students, but there's architects here too. But at the bottom, you'll see Kwesi and Layla. 
uh, students who, some of the students did receive um, prizes and um, it's just a fabulous um, event at the end of the year for the master's thesis students. Uh, here are some examples of studio life, so not in examination format, but of presenting in the studio, the top left, Nicola presenting her project on our interactive whiteboard for interim discussion. The top right, we have uh, just what the studio looks like with big tables. Uh, these students are building models representing something that they've conceived or, or conceptualized. So that's um, a lot of the time is spent designing, practically drawing. So that's an important thing to note. That's the world you're letting yourself in for. Uh, you're not going to be attending short classes and going home and sitting behind your books for hours, but you're going to be here drawing, making uh, in the studio for long hours. It's quite challenging. Um, so that's the world you need to get used to. These are examples of field trips. We go on field trips to landscapes and interesting places to see. Uh, some of them historical. Some of them have got to do with um, ecology. Some are to nurseries, the top left image is to a nursery uh, uh, out in the Powell area. And so it's important for us to take the students on field trips as well to learn about landscapes in practice. Uh, collaboration, we work a lot in, if you enter landscape architecture, you work with um, other disciplines. And in our case, you work with urban design and the Bachelor of City and Regional Planning. And um, we collaborate with those students. It's very much a strength of our program. So you're not working alone just with the landscape architects, but you work with groups from urban design and city planning and their lecturers as well. And in this case, they're working on some collaborative work for uh, projects they're doing on the Cape Flats. And um, sometimes we have community members coming into the studio as well to work with us. These are the bridging courses. I'll give a little bit more detail about them later. For those people coming to landscape architecture, not from a design undergrad, but from a related undergrad, you do need to do bridging courses. And uh, this is just an example of uh, the ones we've just completed. So the bridging courses for the students coming in uh, this year and um, yeah, just examples of how they work in the studio. Lots of model building, as you can see, visual spatial work um, with some of the lecture. Top left is one of our lecturers there. Albert is helping some of the students there. So, so that's, again, the world you're letting yourself in for when you come to study landscape architecture. There, there are theoretical courses as well. So it's not as though there are none. There's history. There's design theory. So... There's writing um, and lots of reading it's, as well. So it's not only a practical course like right. these images show, but there's a lot of um, practical work too. So this is quickly the degrees. Uh, if you look here, the orange ones on the left, the bottom one is the Bachelor, Bachelor of Landscape Architecture. So that's our one-year degree. And uh, following that, on top of that, is the Master of Landscape Architecture, which is also a one-year degree. Um, and this is, this is our school. We're in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Geomatics. Then the green degrees to the right are all the related degrees here that are offered in our program, in our school. So we have urban design, city planning, architecture, and there's a master's in conservation as well. Um, and underneath all of this, there is the Bachelor of Architectural Studies. So that's the only undergrad we have here, but we have a suite of postgrads. Landscape architecture is one of those postgrad degrees. So how do you get in to uh, landscape architecture? So the direct route is if you do come from this bottom left, the blue Bachelor of Architectural Studies, if you have a Bachelor of Architectural Studies, not only from UCT, but a recognized bachelor from wherever, if it's a recognized one, you can come, you can apply to 
enter directly to the honors in landscape architecture or if you have a bachelor of landscape architecture you can come straight into you can apply for entry straight into the um, the honors in landscape architecture uh, then um, from this honors it's important if you follow these orange arrows from here an important thing to note when you study the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture is it allows you to enter again to apply into the urban design program which is a very nice opportunity it's a choice you have so you can either continue into masters or you can go into the urban design degree it also allows you to apply for the MPhil in conservation of the built environment that's about heritage um, but that's important to note because it gives you some options here once you've got the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture. Most students continue to the master, uh, but you can also go to urban design. We've had a few students going that way this year. Then just in terms of practice to the left, remember landscape architecture is a professional degree. So you register as a professional and that gives you license to practice. Uh, after some years of work in practice. So with the bachelor's, you can become a senior landscape architectural technologist, the same type of category as the architects who graduate with the honors. Or if you go on to obtain the master's, you become a professional landscape architect, and that's the one that allows you to work as a professional. So most people do graduate ultimately as a master of landscape architecture because it gives you most scope in practice but however you can go and work after studying your honors then coming to this next block here on the right the orange square this is the bridging courses so landscape architecture we have um we do take in students from what we call related degrees so that means that people who've studied environmental science, geography, sociology, art, those disciplines also are related to landscape architecture and um, those bodies of knowledge have a lot to contribute to the study of the, of the landscape. So we acknowledge the importance of allowing people and the value of allowing people who have these undergrads into landscape architecture. But because you don't have design, you need to do the bridging courses. So the bridging courses are these, these three courses here, which all happen. You can see some more detail about it on the uh, website. But those courses happen in January of the, year of the year you're applying to enter. So the bridging courses don't extend your studies by a whole year. It's important to note that. The bridging courses happen in January. You do have to complete at the moment. There's three. You do have to complete all three. If you do complete them successfully, you then can enter into the landscape architecture um, program. So that's if you have a related degree. Unrelated degrees, uh, you unfortunately can't enter into landscape architecture. So we don't take any undergrad degree. We take from architecture, landscape architecture, or related degrees. And unrelated would be uh, medicine or something like that, which is unrelated. However, planning here, Bachelor of City Planning Honours, planning does take in any, obviously, if you selected, they take in any undergrad degree. So you could obtain the city planning bachelors, and then you can enter in but you'll have to do a, a, a honors you'd have to do another honors which is the landscape architecture honors so that's the longer path if you take that path so these are the three bridging courses uh, again they take place in january each are essentially a week long an intense immersion <laughs> full-time monday to friday eight to five uh, this first one is design computing. That's very important that you get to understand how to use computers in design like CAD. And remember, these are for people who don't come from a design undergrad. Drawing for design is about uh, being a, learning the fundamentals to be able to draw as a tool for design. So it's very important that you're comfortable drawing. Uh, and then on the right is an introduction to spatial design. 
that spatial thinking in the built environment. So three very important foundation blocks for coming into landscape architecture. So that's the bridging courses. Um, uh, then just uh, briefly, you can look at this again on the website in more detail, but if you want to know what courses will you do, what do you do in landscape architecture, what are the courses, so on the left here, you have these, let's call them five major areas, so all the, I won't go through the courses here on the right, you can read up those courses on the, uh, on our website, but just so that you get the basics now, design is the most important skill you learn and that the course on which you spend the most time are your design courses which are practical long practical hours in our design studio ecology is very important landscape architects must understand ecology because we're designing the landscape and ecology is a very important lens with which we understand the landscape construction you do need to just like architects you need to build the landscapes you need to be able to design and then uh, produce construction drawings to build the landscapes that you design so construction is an important part history and theory of course is very important to understand the ideas that we use to design that's where the ideas come from to a great degree and then plants and design very important because plants are a major material that we use so you also will learn about plants so that's a whirlwind super fast uh, look into uh, the course and the, the subjects and the just the, the the nature of being in our in our building and what it's like hopefully that gives you a sense of that so now we are we're going to change gears a little bit and i'm going to ask the three um, people who agreed just to share briefly about the experience of being a landscape architect and studying landscape architecture so it's really these are some of our graduates which are all over the world some of them at the moment um, but i've asked them just to share a little bit about their undergrad very briefly their experience of studying and then where they are now so you can hear it directly from them not from me so i'm going to stop sharing and if we can ask kazeka mbekeni to share first and then uh, we'll go over to Apalele and then lastly to Hayden. So, Kazeka, you're welcome to share your screen. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so, as Clinton said, my name is Kazeka Mbegeni. Um, I did an, an undergrad in architecture. Uh, and I worked at an architectural firm for two years and um, I found there's a sort of disconnect between how uh, buildings sort of integrate with the landscape and that's how I got into landscape architecture. Um, I think my experience of studying landscape architecture, I think obviously there's stuff that I took from um, the architecture undergrad uh, so the design and some elements of construction. Um, but I think the ideas of like ecology, working with plants, obviously uh, working in the public realm, but in way more detail than we sort of were exposed to in the architecture degree. Um, and then working in the micro and macro scale also in more detail. And that was quite nice to sort of collaborate with um, some of the architecture students and some of the courses, the um, urban design students, as well as the city planning students. So you really get like a good understanding of the city on many scales. Um, and then where am I now? Um, so I am currently working as a consultant, consultant or designer at Happy by Nature, which is here in Cape Town. And then I spend some time at TS and during the weeks. So that's where I am now. Um, so yeah. I don't know if I need to say any more. <laughs> okay, no, that's great. Thanks, Kazeka. Maybe we'll get a question or two for you later. Um, and just so that to emphasize again, Kazeka is sitting there in a landscape architect's office here in Cape Town. There's some landscape architects behind her hard at work. So that's an example of um, a, a, 
young person who's entered into the practicing world of landscape architecture. Thanks very much, Kazeka. Um, next, uh, Apalele. Apalele, if you don't mind um, sharing your experience and your pathway. Um, hi, Tintin. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I just tried uh, sharing my camera. Um, I think there's something wrong with it. So unfortunately, you can't see my face, but I'll just share uh, my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just took, uh, took a snap of my resume, and then I'll just speak to that in terms of um, uh, where, uh, where, where am I and uh, my educational background. And um, as you can see on the screen, um, I graduated from UCT, the ML, from the MLA course uh, in 2018. Uh, prior to that, I studied um, uh, landscape technology at CPUT, and CPUT offers um, undergraduate in landscape. Uh, I think now they, they actually offer landscape architecture, but back then it was landscape technology. So I studied the diploma and the BTEC. After that, I entered through the, uh, the short course that Clinton just worked through, uh, work, worked us through now, which is called the introduction to spatial design. I think it's a three weeks or a month course. Um, so yeah, that's that's it um, in terms of my educational background. At the moment, um, I'm currently a professional landscape architect with the Department of Public Works. Um, I also, uh, as you can see them, I also get involved a lot with students, which is quite surprising because I thought um, after I finished with my studies, that would be it with varsity. But um, I've been approached uh, with, by institutions such as CPUT, where I studied, to work with students on a, on a, on a course called uh, Construction Drawings, where we are working with an existing site and unpacking um, what is constructed and putting it down as documentation and drawing so that students can understand how do you uh, take an idea into a constructable information. Um, just to, um, because I'm doing that part time, so I'll be speaking uh, about the lecturing and the work that I'm doing at DPW as a professional. So that's about the, the, the lecturing. At DPW, as I said, I'm a professional landscape architect. And um, the work that I do, I think mainly I can uh, mention three aspects. One is I form an integral part of professional team um, uh, executing in-house projects. So we do have our own in-house projects where we take projects from uh, inception stage, which is the very earliest stage of the project. And um, I provide landscape architectural services for that project from uh, design up until to construction and operation if um, it gets to that point. And the second part is um, I'm, I become, I also form a professional team of a project but a project that is not done in-house, meaning a project will be a state, uh, it will be a development of um, every state property development or maintenance or refurbishment. And there will be a appointed private consultant like uh, Kazeka or HFM. And I would be um, a counterpart in a way, approving uh, or signing off plans and also making sure that um, they practice best practice. So in a way, I'll be signing off their plans uh, before they can um, they can be implemented or their reports before they can be implemented. And then the third part is um, I provide um, a landscape architectural services to other line departments. Um, as we know, uh, public works has got units or any department will have units uh, underneath it. And I'm currently at architectural services, which is under real estate and investment services. And um, within the department, there will be other units such as uh, planning and precinct development, there will be engineering services, there will be town planners, um, and so forth. So for those, those departments, when they need landscape architectural services, they can approach us and I provide um, landscape architectural services to whatever project or aspects they are working in. And before that, I worked briefly, uh, not briefly actually, um, I worked at, at Terra Plus Landscape Architects. I worked there part-time while I was still studying at uh, CPUT and also at UC team. And after my graduation, I worked there for about two months or three months. 
and then I joined the department. I also assisted and worked in the, in the introduction to special design course. Uh, briefly after I graduated, I was invited to form part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the guys who are monitoring and uh, teaching students in that course. Um, and I also have an experience in the construction industry, which is not profession, actually working on site and constructing plans and um, uh, plans, reports, rehabilitation plans that are designed by landscape architects. I worked for a company called Room to Grow in, in, in Cape Town. And this was part of my work in uh, work-based learning, which is part of my undergraduate uh, landscape, landscape technology, CPUT. So um, I, I had a lot of experience with at the on-site construction. Um, yeah, if I have time, I can also talk about some of my other interests and affiliations. As I said, I'm a professional landscape architect. So once you qualify with your master's degree, uh, I think Clinton didn't mention this part, you will have to practice at least for two years in order to register professionally, which means you work for two years and then you compile a portfolio and you, you apply for recognition with SACLAB. And then if you meet the requirements, um, you get to write the exams. And then after that, you will become a professional landscape architect. Or if you uh, exited at honors level, you will become a professional. Um, I don't know what Clinton mentioned, but maybe you will become a junior landscape architect or a senior landscape technologist. Um, I'm also a member of ILASA, which is also an association for landscape architects. I'm a member of, um, I don't think, I don't see it on screen. Oh yeah, Landscape Podia, which is also another voluntary association. And I've been doing a lot of um, voluntary work here at DPW, uh, mentoring and um, uh, tutoring some of the students that have passed through the department who are studying the course that I did at CPUT and UCT. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's about it. I don't know if I have time, Clinton, but um, I thought maybe I might have time to show some of the projects that I worked on, but I think this provided enough information. But if there are further questions as to exactly what type of projects or work we do here, um, I'm, I'm more than happy yeah. to share one page or two pages of some of the projects that I do. Yeah, you can maybe, if you could, I think that will be useful very quickly, just to give us a sense of actually what kinds of projects are you working on? Are they public parks or what yeah. are you actually busy with? But just very quickly will be great. Cool stuff. Yeah, it would be a minute. <laughs> um, did my screen switch? Can you see yeah. my screen now? Okay, cool, cool stuff. Kunye Government Precinct. Yes, um, as I said, um, some of my work involved helping out other line departments, and this was a collaborative project that we did with um, PPD, which is precinct, um, uh, it's, it's precinct development. And it's actually one of the, uh, I don't know, one of type of projects that I'm enjoying working with, because I think as a landscape architect, it's very important to be able to work with teams, be able to collaborate. And this is one of those projects where we actually, because as you know, um, DPW is uh, the custodians of the state properties. So when clients such as SAPS, which is the South African Police Services, or Department of Labor needs new offices, they approach us and we look at the inventory of state property that we have and we analyze what property would, would, would suit them. And the department now decided to actually create precinct instead of having um, one department so that they can share services, they can share spaces, and then they can be integration and then um, civic places can be centralized. So this is one of those projects located in, in Joburg. Um, uh, just above the train station. And I'll just go through some of the important uh, stuff. Um, this is the report that I had to write in the landscape architectural part, just looking at um, what the design philosophy that I'll be following, my involvement, list of the tasks, and uh, some of the analysis that I'm going to look into because we're working with the, with the precinct and we need to understand what is the natural inventory that we actually have on site, looking from bottom up, from the bedrock, um, all of those natural systems that are on site. Um, zooming out just to show context, where is it situated in what catchment and what so and what not, because this will be a highly important, it will inform us on what are we planting, what type of actually uh, building material are we going to use for this, for this area. And zooming into the, the urban fabric, showing some of um, um, what is actually the natural inventory that is on the, on the block, 
and um, what can we learn from that to inform the, the pressing that we're going to be introducing. Um, just some of the important heritage and um, landmarks around the site is you can see it's not so far from the state theater. It's also not so far from the uh, from the fort, which is also one of the most important buildings there. Uh, you can see there's a monument above that. Um, there's a lot of uh, heritage aspects or the heritage uh, landmarks that are surrounding the precinct. Um, yeah, this is just showing um, where uh, we are where we are currently positioning the, the the user and where are we planning to extend in future. Um, and just looking at, because it's a precinct, it's very important to look at how do we actually invite the, the, the we want to make our precinct public, but also at the same time, we want to make sure that the security measures, I developed this program of levels of spaces and which in, within these levels, I sort of say, um, who can get in and whatnot, and there's a lot um, embedded into that. So it was sort of like a gradient of security. Um, yeah, just showing some of the work that we're showing, showing the spatial configuration uh, from public to private spaces. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Clinton. Thank, thank you very much, Apalele. That's very, very useful to see exactly what you end up doing one day, and that's incredibly valuable work. Thank you so much. Uh, Hayden, is Hayden with us? Yeah, yes, there's Hayden. Hayden, over to you. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, it's, I must admit that it's hard going after Apelele. Um, <laughs> <laughs> got a document and a lot going on and it has been working for a long time. Um, I've only worked for about a year now, um, working for Tana Klitzner, who's actually in the background. Probably I should, I should shift it so that she's not in the background. <laughs> um, and we are a small and very productive office and I'm happy to be here. Um, I guess I should, I'm meant to go back eh, to, to, I don't have any, anything to present, but. What, yeah, what was your undergrad? I came from a fine art background, which is, it, it does fit in really well within landscape architecture. It's got um, a lot of the design skills and the conceptual thinking skills. Um, and I, I, I would promote it um, as a background. It's very, it's, it's a brilliant take on the, on the field. Um, it is, like Apalele was saying, to take two years, it, it takes a long time to get, to get the, the, the thinking process going and the use of design skills and learning about what eaves are and all these, all these things. And two years does seem like a very um, right amount of time. Um, I enjoyed the landscape architecture course a lot. It's learning just constantly and it doesn't really stop. And I don't, I don't, it is a field with a lot of information and a lot of um, different tra trajectories, um, like seeing Apalele and the, the lots of presentations and a larger scale and lots of unpacking of, of um, um, many layers. And it, it looks all very complicated and overwhelming, but I, I think something to, bear in mind is that it does take a long time to make those things. And you spend a lot of time almost like fleshing out um, even the, the ground, you know, you, you spend time like touching the soil and touching the, seeing what plants exist on the site already. And um, it's a very layered field, which is very beautiful. Um, and, and then what I didn't realize before coming in was that there are a lot of, um, a lot of levels that you can be dealing with you know you can be dealing with the the way the balustrade joins to the brickwork you know maybe that takes a lot of revisions and it takes a lot of time or you could be zooming out to doing a whole neighborhood and um and i think it's something that you that you can almost decide as an individual you know you don't have to you're not sucked into the city planning aspect of it or the you know um I, we in the same office as ccni architects and we work closely with them on a lot of projects and it's been very beautiful to 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 see how they think and then to almost negotiate on a lot of um, the principles and the, the follow through with them um, and it feels very different to when we have to work on a conceptual framework plan that is large scale and we work in a bit of a vacuum 
Um, and to mention Apalele for the last time, it is, it is a field that works with a lot of different um, um, other specialists, you know, so sometimes we, we have, we're always working with landscape contractors who will show us the plants and how big they are and how healthy they are. And then, um, today we went to a, a paving company to see what, um, if we liked the, the finishes of it. Um, and then you often have to argue with engineers because they don't want the le levels changed. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's, an, um, it's an ongoing practice. And I, I think there should be many more landscape architects in Cape Town and the world. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much, Hayden. Appreciate that very much. Maybe tell okay. us very briefly, what are you currently working on? Oh, a lot. Um, <laughs> The most exciting thing. Uh, the Very most briefly. exciting thing. We came from a, um, we're working on the third phase of a, of a big youth development center in Delft, um, which is past the airport, kind of um, 15 minutes from the southern suburb. And it's on a third phase, so like the third phase of major um, buildings. And it's a youth development center and it's huge and beautiful and um, in the middle of a very sandy, very windy um, Delft landscape. We have these buildings that nestle in with one another and it, um, we've helped to carefully manage the levels so that we have amphitheaters for, for sitting and um, beautiful slopes and feel. You'll see the photos in, in awards uh, <laughs> shortly, um, but it, I've loved doing the, like the steps and seeing like how things join and um, knowing what happens in each building and kind of um, seeing what, having to negotiate a lot of that stuff. And then um, Tana's daughter is also getting mad. So we're doing a lot, of, a lot of chatting about that, which is also very exciting. I can imagine. Okay, thank you very much, Hayden, very much. That gives us a very nice uh, view into very valuable kind of work like a youth development center, I think you said as well, which is great. And yeah. how you are helping to bring the, the old, overall plan and the buildings to stand in relation well with each other, etc. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a good view into that. So appreciate it very much. So thank you. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, Aiden, sure, please stay on. There may be a question or two later. Okay, um, well. Kazeka, Hayden, and Apalele, thank you very much. So sure. I'm just going to share my screen to finish up with uh, some information about the application and selection processes. And then we can go through some questions and answers at the end. So it won't be too much longer. Um, Okay, so um, um, yeah, we look at the application and selection requirements, uh, where to find the information you need, how to apply, and then the deadlines, which is um, uh, very important. So let me just start with the, the right-hand side, the minimum requirements. So as I've mentioned before, you either have a, a Bachelor of Architectural Studies from UCT, or any other architecture uh, degree, which is equivalent to a three-year bachelor's degree, or a landscape architecture degree as a minimum requirement. Uh, so it's a three-year bachelor's from architecture or landscape architecture, and then a three-year bachelor's degree from a related degree, uh, but non-design, but related, like environmental science, art as Hayden was talking about, geography, um, that kind of undergrad, and then you will need to do the bridging courses. Uh, then on the left hand side, the selection criteria, we prefer uh, an average of 65% for your courses. If you come from a design background, you do need to submit a portfolio of your creative work, and then some or other essay, some other um, evidence of your writing or literacy skills, and then a letter of motivation, which just tells us why you want to study landscape architecture. So this is just a snapshot or a screenshot from our webpage. 
it's uh, if you go through UCT through Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, and then you go, you'll 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 come to our page, uh, School of Architecture, Planning, Geomatics, and then to Landscape Architecture. And on the right hand side there is some very useful information that we've got, and it's very important information. This information here. Uh, especially the application information there in the middle. Um, that's very important because uh, the application process is relatively long. And um, however, if you uh, put all your information in quickly, then we can actually give you a result on your application very quickly. So, but I'm just emphasizing, read it very carefully and you'll get more than enough information you need there. We also put the recording of this session on there as well. So you can look at it again. And we have at the bottom, we have uh, examples of student work. So you get a very good view of what you're letting yourself uh, in for. Um, then uh, applications, just quickly, uh, again, you'll get more information on the website, but uh, the kinds of things you need when you do your online application, so it's an online application, uh, is your latest results, um, and a CV, and your letter of motivation, and a portfolio of design work. Um, and again, make sure you meet the requirements there, in terms of submitting the information. Um, so do exactly what they say. For instance, if it says certified copy, make sure it's a certified copy because it will just hold your application back. So then in terms of the deadlines, um, uh, end of October, into, I'm not sure if we have any international applicants in this room, but um, uh, 31st of October is the deadline. And especially if you're doing bridging, we need to know about that early and you need to know about that early. So we, you need to get your application in by the end of October. Uh, however, up until 30 November, we will accept applications up until then. Um, very important here at the bottom is the funding deadlines, three to six months before the start of the academic year. So if you want funding, which most people are desperately trying to get, then get your application in early and so that you can begin to provide evidence of your application, that sort of thing, but get access to the kind of funding opportunities and so on. Um, but it's very important for a range of reasons. Don't wait until 30 November. Don't even wait until 31st of October. Um, uh, I highly recommend you get your application if you're interested in as early as possible because we will give you an answer very quickly too. If all your information is there, we can respond to you. And by July uh, or August, you can already know whether we're offering you a place in the program or not. And of course, that gives you the ability to make informed and timiest decisions about moving to Cape Town or applying for funding, etc. So I, I cannot stress it enough for your own sanity. Get your application in early into the program. So, um, all right, Christine, are those, uh, are those some of the um, um, uh, questions that have come through? Yeah, the, I've just added the top two have just come through. Okay, let me, so at this point, anybody want to, I can't always see the hands, maybe Christine can see if there's any hands, but I'll share screen again and I'll go through the questions that have come through. Otherwise, we, once I've gone through these questions, then we're nearing the end. So if you have a question, quickly pop it in the chat or at the at least just put up your hand so we can make sure we can get your question answered you obviously also can email us so are you welcome to do that as well so let me just go through these ones um so 
honors in landscape architecture, do you enter the MUD program in the second level? Um, if I understand that correctly, uh, with an honor, you cannot enter the MUD program because the uh, Master of Urban Design with an, a three year bachelor's, you have to have your fourth year, which is an honors year. So you have to have an honors degree to go into the Master of Urban Design, uh, which is a one year master's. So yes, you can with the honors in landscape architecture, it is an accepted um, uh, degree for application to the Master of Urban Design, which is then a master's, which I'm, I think is what is meant by second level. So yes, you can enter the Masters of Urban Design. And again, that's a very useful thing to know because it gives you, if you enter the Honours in Landscape Architecture, you can stay in Landscape Architecture or go to Urban Design. Um, and that just gives you choice. It, it, it empowers you with some choice. So please, whoever posted that, post in the chat if I haven't answered that correctly. Is it possible to do the course part-time? Yes, we do have a part-time, but be very careful with what part-time means. Uh, part-time doesn't mean after hours. That's very important. We don't have any after hours classes where you work full-time during the week and then after hours come to university. You can't do that. We allow you to do the, 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 the degrees, the honors degree, um, especially very few people do it with a master's because there's less courses, but the honors degree, it's most um, usually people who can't study full week take half the courses. Roughly, we give you the ability to apply for half the courses in the first year, and then you take two years, you do a second year, and you complete the honors in two years, you do the other half of the courses in the second year. So it's important to note it's not after hours, but yes, you get roughly half your week to work if you need to work and the other half of your week you come and study. Just take note that the halves are not split perfectly down the middle. So you won't have class Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday morning and you work Friday afternoon, uh, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, Friday. The, uh, the courses are spread over, so you do need flexibility to be able to attend classes across the week, but then you can get to work if you need to. Uh, how is the course affected by COVID? So we, if, the, if the regulations are very tight, we work online, and we did work online during the hard lockdown very successfully. We completed the degree. The degree continues. Uh, students registered, we continued with all the work. So in other words, it is possible online, uh, online during uh, even the high uh, uh, COVID levels, um, lockdown levels. But now in the low lockdown level, um, we are essentially not affected except for the fact that you need to wear masks, etc. You need to, uh, you need to, uh, apply by the regulations in that sense, but we are back on campus now with most of our courses and um, we are returning to a very similar mode before COVID. We are actually keeping certain things online because it's actually, we actually found it works to quite a uh, successful degree to have certain things online. So we're keeping things online, um, but the course does not stop uh, you never know what will happen, of course. That's what COVID taught us. But even in the highest lockdown level, we could continue. Uh, computer and software requirements. So we do use computers absolutely in, in the course, as well as landscape architecture. You use computers a lot. CAD, uh, Photoshop, InDesign, you use them a lot. You do need to have a laptop. When you study landscape architecture, you need a laptop. Uh, you can email us if you want to know what the requirements are, but um, the university has labs which, you, which have the software on them. So you don't need to purchase the software. You do need to have the laptop, but you don't need to purchase the software. Uh, and there are, of course, some free programs as well you can use. So generally, you don't need to purchase software. Software is available. Even if we can't come to campus, you can link up to the labs remotely. So, so when we're in, in COVID times, you don't need to suddenly buy a whole lot of expensive software. So 
we supply the software through linking to our labs, but you need to supply a laptop. Uh, and there are four more questions that came through in the chat. Can I read them out to you? Yes, sure. So the one was, what would the funding possibilities for the degree be? Are there any in particular? Okay. So um, we do have... Uh, generally, some bursaries are available. Public Works and Department of Public Works has given quite a few bursaries over the years. They come and go depending on their funding. Um, there are, is a, the Institute of Landscape Architects has been very generous in providing at least a bursary for somebody, might be two a year, depending again on their, uh, Christine acknowledges, so they might be two a year depending on their uh, available funds. Then uh, you can, and this is another reason to get your application in quickly, because through U UCT, there are also funding opportunities through UCT, but then you need to be in and registered in the program, etc. There are funding opportunities within the university. So, um, and the surprising thing is, uh, I'm always surprised to hear how many of our students have access to some form of funding. It may not be a 100% bursary, but it could be a 20% fees off because of some application they put in, etc. So if generally, if you do the work, the bursaries are there. It's, 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 I want to say very, but I'll say it's quite likely you'll get some form of assistance somehow. Um, but yes, there are opportunities. You just need to get in the system and start uh, applying. Hopefully that answers that question. And in our application information, there are some links to funding opportunities, et cetera, there. So please have a look in there as well. Christine? Next question is, what are the job prospects in South Africa and abroad in the field of landscape architecture, as opposed to, say, mainstream architecture? Um, I would say they're quite similar. The, in terms of the first answer I always give to that is the job prospects for landscape architecture are similar to the other built environment disciplines. So I think when the built environment and the construction industry is a little bit slow, then the job prospects for architects, civil engineers, landscape architects are also a little slow. But when the construction industry picks up, then there's job prospects are a little bit better. So that's a, an answer there. They're very similar across them. Uh, landscape architects, however, if you want to talk about in relation to architecture, landscape architects are actually able to do a wider variety of projects. So Hayden was talking about very small detail design work right through to big, large scale environmental planning projects like visual impact assessments, environmental management frameworks, et cetera. And those often continue over and above the slumps and the rises in the construction industry. So, but you need to be uh, working in those fields as well. So I think there's ways you can cushion yourself in terms of the ebbs and flows in the construction industry. Um, most of our graduates seem to find work somewhere. So it's we, well, that's it. They, they just seem to find work and they're working. We, we seldom hear of somebody. And again, if the industry is down, then maybe somebody battles a little bit, but generally people find work. And yes, overseas, lots of people do go overseas and work with their qualifications. It is important to note, you cannot register as a professional. Like you do in South Africa, you need to work for a while and then you register with a professional council. If you go overseas, you also need to uh, study through their, not study, but you need to undertake their professional registration exam. So, you, so if you're a professional in South Africa or have a degree, you can't just work as a professional in the UK or wherever, but the landscape architects who go over work in firms where the principals in the firms are registered in those countries and that allows them to work in those firms. So it's like in South Africa. So if you have a degree, but you're not a professionally registered landscape architect yet, you work in a firm where the principal landscape architect is a professionally registered landscape architect like Hayden, I'm not sure about Kazeka, Apalele said he's professionally registered 
but if you're still young and you're not professionally registered, you can work in a firm. So that's how it works overseas as well. But we are often surprised how many people do work overseas in the Middle East, in Dubai, and in the UK, in the Netherlands. We've got students working there at the moment. Uh, one of our recent graduates was in France recently. So it's possible, very possible, yes. Christine? Um, what are the major working differences between obtaining the honors versus obtaining the master in landscape architecture? Um, the difference, do you th is that, Christine, you think in terms of studying the two, the different... Um, I, I, presume, I presume work experience. And what you can do you when you... Uh, once you're working, I yeah. assume, yes. Um, can, I say, can, can I say something? Yes, is that Hayden? Yeah, in, we've discussed it quite a lot in our office, and we've agreed that it's it it's ridiculous to to well not ridiculous maybe it's not the right word but you you shouldn't do just do just an honors yeah it it's it was just a masters and then they split it up I think for UCT to get more graduates technically but um, you don't actually finish any major projects on your own in the honors so you don't. You don't get that experience of coming up with your own design theory and have, like almost developing your own design principles. Um, so you'd, you'd struggle in an office. Okay, so there you got an answer from Hayden. Um, but obviously you can go and work if you want to with the honors. So we, we for interest, interestingly enough, we, um, so I agree with Hayden, but just interestingly, quite a number of our honors graduates from last year 2021 graduates have not continued straight on they've gone to work somewhere and get experience etc and then they'll they might come back later so um we haven't tracked what they're all doing but um uh, it is possible to move elsewhere and then come back uh Apalele, did you want to uh, add something there yes yes um i actually also want, wanted to comment on the um, on the previous comment about uh, what kind of work can you do with honors. Um, I think it was brilliant that um, UCT actually created that because as you said, Quentin, um, it's more likely that you will get funding, but sometimes people enter the course with um, with uh, with hope that they will get the, the funding, but then they don't. I think it was actually brilliant that uh, you guys did that. And I don't think there's a problem with people exiting with honors. And I think one of the most important thing that I think students should start looking at at this stage is to look at um, SACRAP. Uh, SACRAP actually have um, um, a, a table where you can see um, the core competences that you need to be to be able to, 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 to deliver at what level. So if you have your owners, it doesn't mean you don't have a place in the industry. You do have a place in the industry and you can actually elevate up to the point whereby you can actually start your own, your own company. But as it was said in the beginning that in the beginning stage of your, your career, you will need a mentor. You'll have to work for someone or you can practice on your own, but then SACAP will request that you are registered with a mentor. Um, just to, to comment on what Hayden was saying, I think uh, maybe they were just looking at it in terms of like the academics or the, um, the qualification, but I'm just thinking about it in terms of practice and practicality, more especially in South Africa, um, where funding can be problematic for most people. Um, I think if I didn't get the DPW funding, I would have actually stopped with my BTEC. I, I wouldn't even go even to the BTEC. I think I would have stopped in diploma. So I think it's very important that institutions are actually acknowledging the first, the fact that not all of us can actually afford masters. And SACLAP doesn't actually want you to have only master to register with them. You can actually register as a, as a technologist and you can, you can practice the landscape architectural work. Of course, as you said, continue, you will need a principal landscape architect to sign off your plans but you can still practice on your own. You just have to share a little bit of that money with the principal. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, uh, Kaz? Um, I'm just sort of jumping off what Hayden and uh, Apalula said. Um, yeah, they both are very correct. 
Um, but I think also just to note, uh, just look at maybe also which country you want to work in, because I know some countries don't recognize an honors degree. They do want the full masters. So um, yeah, just also review that before making your decision about what you, uh, where you want to start. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thanks, Kazeka Hayden. Um, I completely agree with Apalele. I, uh, it, the, I think the two comments go well together. I think maybe one thing to add is that if you don't come from a architecture or landscape architecture background, then your first year is like almost a whirlwind and it's you, you would be spat out of the honors without the masters. Maybe that's the way of putting it too. Okay, thanks Hayden. Uh, I'm aware everybody it's two, two o'clock already, so we'll wrap up soon. But Christine, I think there's one more question. Yeah, there's one more. Um, can I go straight into studying the landscape architecture honors after the BAS degree without having to do that fourth year out? Yes, so you can come straight into landscape architecture. So we don't have the same requirement as architecture does with a year out. You can come straight into landscape architecture. So if you don't want to take a year out, come study landscape architecture for a year and then go into your honors in architecture, you'll be able to register professionally as a landscape architectural technologist and an architectural technologist. So if you play your cards like that, then you can empower yourself later. All right, I think we must wrap up there because it's just after two o'clock. So please email us. You do have our email addresses. Um, if you have any questions that you think about later or we haven't answered, please do that. Uh, we will, Christine, po uh, uh, upload this recording onto the website as well that we showed you. So you can listen to it again there. Or if you know anybody else is interested, just send them straight to the recording. Um, and then that leaves me just to thank very much Kazeka, Hayden, and Apalele. You guys were very helpful in sharing your experience and your opinions, etc. We got a very nice view into what landscape architects do. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll also forward questions to you if somebody wants to know more from you. Otherwise, thank you so much. And then thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Christine, as well, for managing things behind the scenes, too, and working so hard on getting the presentation together, too. Thank you so much for that. Otherwise, please visit our website and then um, email us if you have any other questions. Thank you very much, everybody. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.